Today, I wanna to begin our time with a question. Have you ever insisted on having your own way, even against the advice of others? Well, I don't think anyone can honestly say that they've never done this. We do it as children, we do it as teenagers, we do it as adults, we do it as seniors. We know better than anybody else and we go ahead and do something. Have you ever regretted getting your own way? Well, in today's lesson, we're gonna be going to 1 Samuel and we're going to be seeing how Israel insisted on having their way. And I think came to the point of realizing that they may have made a mistake, but God allowed them to do so because he had a different intent than theirs was. So let's begin this morning at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they weren't like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and they perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you're now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So the people didn't want Samuel's sons to act as judges, and for good reason. They took bribes, they perverted justice. But in the process of refusing to accept their leadership, they went a step further and they rejected gods. They recognized a problem and jumped to conclusions about which solution would serve them best. But we as people were rarely good judges concerning what is best and most needful. God sees the whole picture and we see snapshots. And a snapshot can be misleading. It reminds me of a story I've heard a number of variations of that I wanna share this morning. So there's a Chinese proverb that goes like this. It says a farmer and his son had a beloved stallion who helped the family earn a living. One day, the horse ran away, and their neighbors exclaimed, your horse ran away. What terrible luck. And the farmer replied, well, maybe so, maybe not. We'll see. A few days later, the horse returned, leading a, a few wild mares back to the farm as well. And the neighbors shouted out, your horse has returned, and several other horses have come home with him. What great luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. We'll see. Later that week, the farmer's son was trying to break one of the mares and she threw him to the ground, breaking his leg. The villagers cried, oh, your son has broken his leg. What terrible luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not, we'll see. A few weeks later, soldiers from the National Army marched through town recruiting or conscripting all the able-bodied boys for the army. They didn't take the farmer's son, who was still recovering from his injury. Friends shouted, oh, your boy is spared. What tremendous luck. To which the farmer replied, maybe not. Maybe so. We'll see. We can be too quick to judge a situation based on a snapshot and determine the be next best course of action. The Israelites did it and ended up rejecting God in the process in favor of a flawed human ruler. We want a king to rule over us. They had a king, but they chose to reject what they had. So let's go to 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 20, where Samuel shares God's warning. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons, and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army, and some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops, 
and some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters and, from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So what was the warning? A king, a human king, would literally make them slaves. Take the best of everything they had forced their sons and daughters to do work. They weren't going to be employed like we think of being employed. They would simply be taken and used. And any payment that the king was required to make would simply come out of taxes. Don't we all understand that? So, even with this warning, the people's minds are made up. They, did they think that Samuel was just a sore loser, an old stick in the mud, that he was exaggerating to show his disapproval? Oftentimes, we disregard advice based on those things. For years, they had sought Samuel's advice. But now that he tells them something they don't want to hear, they wave it off like, yeah, yeah, whatever. We want what we want, and we're not interested in hearing anything that doesn't support what we want. It reminds me of me as a teenager. I had moved away from home when I was 17, and a year later, I began the process of purchasing a car. I wasn't entirely certain it was a good idea, but I really wanted a car. I prayed that God would show me what I should do. I even prayed that he would put roadblocks in my way if he knew it would be better that I hold off. Well, he did. You put the roadblocks in place. And I hurdled them like an Olympian athlete. Each and every one of them, determined to have my way, no matter the words I prayed. I got the car and I ended up struggling to make payments, borrowing money from my sister. And eventually my first car met its demise in a hit on car accident. But an accident that proved to be the turning point in my life for getting serious about my relationship with God. He knew that a car would cause me problems. He knew I'd end up in the hospital, but he also knew it would force me to choose between taking his word under advisement and really listening and obeying. God allowed me to have what I wanted, but for a different reason than was for my intent. And so is the true with the Israelites. God gives them what they want. And in 1 Samuel 9, 1 to 2, we read, there was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphia, of the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. God gives them exactly what they're looking for. He gives them a king, Saul, the seemingly perfect candidate. They traded God for a tall, good-looking son of a rich man. They had set the bar really low. They think it's I, but God wanted to show them that that wasn't the case. God delivered to them what they sought, a king. And Saul became king at the age of 30, and he reigned for 42 years. But at some point, this man who had begun as a rather reluctant leader I don't know if you remember the story, but when they were choosing by lots who would be the next king, they found him in the baggage, afraid to stick his head out. But reluctant at first, he eventually grows overconfident, and he even assumes a role of priest, making a sacrifice he wasn't entitled to make, and gets rejected by God. He had developed the attitude that many positions of privilege can fall into the trap of feeling that he was above the law, didn't have to take orders from God or anyone else. 
After that, his downward trajectory simply continues to pick up speed. In fact, as he gets to the place where he's almost crazy and irrational, we might think that God would take this opportunity to provide the people with an all-knowing, I told you so. But instead, rather than attempting to get the people to go back to the old way of doing things, he gives them a king of his choosing, someone that, from all outward appearances, didn't quite fit the bill, but whom God knew was a better choice than Saul. So we're going to go now to chapter 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I've rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointing. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadad to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this isn't the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shemia. But again, Samuel said, neither is this one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. And then he asked, are, there any, are these all your sons? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Samuel said, send for him at once. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes, and the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil, and the spirit of the Lord came up powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. God chose David over Saul and over each one of his seven brothers. But he was certainly not anyone else's first pick. Notice Samuel's reaction. He sees Eliab and says, surely this one. God says, no. And even Jesse, even Jesse David's own father, didn't recognize that he was king material at all. He'd left him in the fields. He knew that one of his sons was going to be anointed the next king and dismissed David as a prospect. But despite David's youth and inexperience, he was a man after God's own heart because his confidence was in God entirely, not himself. This alone would make him a better king than Saul. So what can we learn from this story today? Well, I think one of the first things is we need to be careful about what we insist upon. We might get it. Secondly, take God's warnings to heart. He knows what he's talking about. Our ideals often fall short of God's best. And finally, sometimes God lets us learn the hard way by letting us have what we're so insistent on so that after learning our lesson, we're more willing to try things his way. This past week, we've had our prayer emphasis. We've seen how God works in our weakness as we humble and submit ourselves in our suffering and when we actively choose to live in his wisdom through obedience. No matter what we face in life, God is fully aware. Nothing escapes his attention. Nothing is outside of his knowledge. 
So never insist on your own way, but rather wait, trust, obey. We want God's power to move on our behalf, but it requires that we recognize our weakness and get out of the way, not only in the face of seemingly insurmountable difficulties, but always and every day. When it comes to knowing what the future holds, we can never outguess what God actually knows.